All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Zach Guten, who is up in LA. How are you doing, Zach? Doing great, John. Great to be back on. Great to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. And uh, Zach uh, beginning, uh, began his career as a marketing manager of Script Magazine and launching the Scriptwriter Showcase event at Universal Studios, then rose to vice president of the final, at Final Draft, an industry leading software company. 2015, you launched your firm, Think Alike Media. You've been consulting with iconic entertainment brands like Variety, and you have executed influencer product launches in the fashion industry lately. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is utilizing intent data in story-driven outreach. So to begin with, Zach, just for people, because intent and the concept of intent data has been around for a, a while now. Mm -hmm. but it's gone through a lot of different iterations and that. so just talk to just explain to our audience a little bit about intent data first and then uh, and then how it's been used yeah i think intent data does have a, a couple of different definitions depending on the form of marketing that you're doing and the way that you're observing intent mm -hmm. um in, in our in our form of, of cold outreach we're really observing that uh through email and we're taking a, a multi-channel approach to outreach and it's what we're seeing from intent data in the email that helps dictate what else we're going to do in terms of the other channels so for example if we see that a prospect is engaging heavily through email but hasn't yet responded that's someone we're going to prioritize a linkedin outreach to as well yeah. so leveraging what we can see from their own interest that for instance uh, not just opening an email but to us more importantly is also clicking a link coming to a client's website and if that's Starts to, we start to see some repetition there where now they're returning to that website a couple of different times over the course of a few weeks. That's what we call intent data. We know they're looking. We know that they have an intent to, to, to perhaps respond and, and, and perhaps explore this. We want to find a way to kind of nudge that along. And I think, you know, one of the important things that we can do uh, with intent data is build trust. When we mm -hmm. see that someone is looking, um, part, of, part of the reason a lot of times I believe that they haven't responded yet is they're still looking to feel a sense of trust and they are if they've received cold outreach all they've received so far is an interaction with with one person and perhaps you know, a couple of messages to start to see more of who's involved in the business their backgrounds um, and that's how we're leveraging multi-channel approach to know okay this person's interacting with this person's email maybe they should be introduced to another colleague from the company on linkedin start to build that awareness of the whole company um, and, and, and we use intent to, to sort of learn how to do that and who to, who to do that with. Yeah. And I guess, uh, I mean, part of it is uh, in, intent, intentionality, right? Because uh, the way you're talking about doing the outreach, it's not that one that you see, like, you know, like my least favorite one on uh, LinkedIn is when somebody sends you a lovely personalized connection and then you accept it because you think, oh, they took some time over this and immediately ping up pops the sales pitch email immediately. Um, and therefore now you've gone from, oh, that was nice. They did a nice, out, you know, I reached to me to, oh, it's just another spam. You got it. And, you know, I, I have clients in really every industry. It's part of what is fun about the work that I do. I, I come from an entertainment and media background. So probably about half of my clients do come from there. I really come from a media and entertainment technology background. So I have a lot of companies that come to us from, from technology and we work with companies in so many different industries and their targets are so diverse in, the, in who they want to be reaching out to the through line the thing that is the a similarity for all of them is they're still people mm. and so it's really critical that we are one observant of how people should interact with people and and to your point john it's you know if if i walked up and introduced myself and suddenly started handing you a flyer you yeah. would not take our relationship very seriously at that point so you know we really want to ingratiate and warm up that relationship and find opportunities to provide a service and and, and pro to provide help and i think it's another important thing in, in story driven marketing of, of course is always solving a problem that's what story is mm -hmm. all about is is is, the, is is a journey of a problem being solved and in this case that really should be happening for the prospect for the prospect going i've got this problem this company can help me solve it and uh, and, and really in, you know intent data helps us to understand who's maybe experiencing that problem the strongest and you know we want to be there to help them we don't necessarily need to be rushing up to them to you know ask them for a credit card to go to the sales pitch 
let's build a relationship. Yeah. And, and like you said, with the multi-channel approach as well, because you don't, I mean, nowadays you don't really know how people like to be communicated with. You don't really know where they're the most active. And those are the kind of information that you need in order to be able to connect to them. Because as you said, maybe a, an email, maybe that's not going to do it. They may interact with the email. They may even come to your website. But as you said, maybe they need that more kind of personal outreach on, on LinkedIn or something where now their work, they can see somebody, they can see their profile, they feel a little more comfortable. So you, you really do need to look at how, you know, that there are multiple different ways of communicating with people and people have, have preferences. Yeah, you know, and, and I think I was on your show about two years ago, and I think two years ago, I didn't even bring up the idea of messaging people on LinkedIn because just two years ago, yeah. it didn't really seem as viable. But that's what's happening. Change is happening, and we have to be aware of that change. Uh, you know, the the the, the ground beneath our sh our feet is shifting, um, and so from a marketing perspective, if we're not acknowledging that that change is happening, we're going to leave our clients in a position where they're doing things the wrong way because change has occurred. And so one of the ways I, I observe that, for example, in relation to LinkedIn is if you think about who it is that we're targeting, any industry, any business, there's hardly anybody ever comes to me and says, hey, we want to target somebody way down the food chain, like the chain of command. No, we're typically targeting somebody who's of influence within a business. That means they're smart. They've got good judgment making skills, decision making skills. They were hired in, in, in those roles for, for a reason. So, you know, we, we have to think of like, what does it take to earn somebody's trust in, in, in that capacity? And, 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 and where do they want to be met? Where do they want to be interacted with? And at one point in time, there was a, a, a group of people where email was absolutely the best way. And I still mm -hmm. believe very firmly that email is where most of the eyeballs are. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's why we start there from an intent data perspective. But in terms of building trust, we know that there is a younger generation of executives mm -hmm. now who are in those roles that everybody wants to target. And they're much more accustomed to uh, communicating on forms of social media primarily LinkedIn from a professional standpoint. And there's ways to, as you were saying, build you know that awareness. We want them to see the profiles of my clients. Most of my clients are startups. Um, mm -hmm. And even if they're not, even the bigger ones, this is just as true. If I've got a prospect who's interacting with a message frequently, someone who's really looking at this, and if you put yourself in their shoes, if you're coming back right. to a link over and over, you're looking. Yep. I want them to meet someone else within the business now. I want them to see their backgrounds, their professional backgrounds and go, wow, you know what? That person worked at that company and, and I know somebody there. To, that It starts to build and deepen those roots. And that's where it's interesting that in that strategy where we're leading with email, utilizing LinkedIn to sort of follow based on who's interacting the most in, in email, still after somebody accepts a connection request on LinkedIn, a lot of times they still come back and respond in the email. Yeah. Yep. So to me, it just goes to show they've built the trust. They know where to com communicate directly, but they needed that ingredient of trust. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And one thing you mentioned there that I think is really important as well is, it's sometimes we can get carried away marketing marketers and salespeople of looking at people are as a prospect or, and then maybe, and then a decision maker. We love to put all these labels on them and they do have a role to play. But we can't forget, to your point, that they're humans, right? And they have skills and they're accomplished, and, and so so you have to be, you have to meet them at a, at a you know on a playing field of level playing field of mutual respect, right. and not just and not seeing them as this narrow label. That's exactly right. You know, one of the other ways that we try to do that is through uh, is, is through uh, what we call um, social proof. You know, social proof can come in so many different shapes and forms. It could be, it's great if there's an article about your company or some thought leadership that you've posted online on a blog or LinkedIn or something like that, and, and you want to link to that. That's fantastic. But it doesn't even have to be so directly married together to mm -hmm. the business. If I have a client who uh, is uh, serving an industry where there's a new compliance regulation coming about that they, they provide services to achieve, um, talking to that industry and pointing to articles about that compliance, you know, within their trade, within their profession, that that deadline's coming June 1st, you know, we can point to the fact that this isn't just about us as a business or my client and the service that they provide, but look, there's an awareness of this problem out here. There's people who need this to be accomplished in this time frame. Here's social proof of that. 
you're one of the businesses who has to meet yeah. this requirement. We're one of the businesses that helps people get there. So it's it's it it goes from just like hey, talking about yourselves, which is the worst form of marketing. Right. I mean, being story driven is always about talking about their problems mm -hmm. in the first place, and to take it almost broaden it out to go and never mind just your problem and what I can do for you. But look, there's other people out there talking about this. It's safe for us to talk about this because yeah. look, there's articles about this problem. You can admit this is a challenge for you. And that's where from a prospecting standpoint, they want to engage with things that solve their problems. And yeah. if you can demonstrate that you know how to actually solve their problems, you really understand it, that gives you the likelihood of a response. Yeah, and then when it comes to actually, you know, storytelling itself, right? I mean, you want also for that to have an authenticity to it, to have, to be real and not to be like, oh, this isn't really a story. This is really, I mean, it's like one of those things that, you know, when people pay for advertorials in, in on online magazines or back in the old days and printed magazines, you're like, oh, this is an editorial. No, it's not. It's an advert. <laughs> so I think the storytelling too has to have that element of authenticity and not to be, you know, not to look like just a, a vehicle to to get a to get your message out. That's exactly right. I mean, and that comes down to you know the right words as well. I I, I really believe very firmly that you know it it really is about wordsmithing this and and not from trying from my perspective trying to be as clever as possible. Yeah. But rather understanding if I were my client, if I had the 20 years of experience in their industry that I have in mind, how would I walk around a room of people, let's say a trade show and have conversations like this? What would we be saying? What words would we be using? What phrases would we be using? Because from a marketing perspective, we sometimes look at, at you know, trying to communicate a message as clearly as possible as a marketer. Um, and at the same time, there's a very human side of how we speak to one another in conversation. And I like if, if as best possible to really start to become a, a mouthpiece for what my clients would be saying anyway, the things that they would be saying conversationally with someone. And sometimes that's easy to get out of them early on. And sometimes it's not. Uh, and, and that becomes part of the challenge of working together. Uh, is, is really ironing that out and, and looking at metrics to figure out when it's working. Because when you do say the right things on the other side, on the receiving end, it really does feel like the start yeah. of a conversation. Yeah, and and that's the and I think that's the key part. And people want that. You know, they want it. They want to have uh, good conversations. They want to know that the person they're talking to. It's. I, I think it's. What was the research recently? Like you know, seen, heard, and understood. It just seems so basic, but that. Uh, Apparently, particularly after COVID, that's what came as the as the wow. the most important thing to people is to be seen, heard, and understood. Mm -hmm. And what you're talking about there is you're even in your storytelling, you're seeing them, you're putting them in the store, you're understanding their their problem, they're feeling like they're heard and understood. There, there's yeah. a resonance there. I love that. That's that's that's. I mean, I, that's really well put. And and I think you know that that is. Um, to, in a sense, you know, people's egos need to be addressed mm -hmm. and they need to know that there's a, an element of authenticity that this person really understands them. And if that rings true, it usually comes from from authenticity. It's it's usually hard to to, to fake authenticity. Uh, and and, uh, and and when you can get that to resonate through a prospect realize, realizes you work with businesses like mine, you must because you're speaking my language, because you're talking about things that matter to me. You're using phrases that would sound like if I was talking to someone at a trade show where we have the same background. And uh, it's 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 really important from a marketing perspective, all the framework and the things that that every marketing expert, whether they work externally from businesses or internally, the things that they want to do well. Um, oftentimes, you get this tunnel vision of yeah. like, I know I'm supposed to do it this way, um, and it's it's so important to remember like, well, what does that conversation actually sound like? Because maybe there's a reason to do it a little differently. And and my clients, when we get that through, when that comes through. Beautiful moment. Yeah, and and you just said uh, uh, an interesting thing too, you know, about the about the this, this the storytelling and the authenticity. I mean, and and going back to what it would be like if we were in person or just like this, 
if I'm telling you a story, right? If I'm telling you, if I'm telling you a story, normally it's not going to sound like a testimonial. It's not going to sound like it was structured. I opening with this, and then I'm going to tell you this. It's going to be a little more meandering, but it's going to be, and I'm going to bring in elements into it that are interesting and to grab your attention. And I think that's the problem. Sometimes we we forget what it's like to actually tell a story when we try to write it down. You know, length of messages is something that clients talk to us about. And I, uh, I tell them, you know, I, I do my, I'm going to err a little bit on the side of, of longer. And, mm -hmm. and that kind of creates a little bit of a, of a hesitation. Like, well, I think short is the way to go in email. Well, one of the things that people think works in email is this sort of short and sweet approach. And, and there's certainly merit to it. It's not to be mm -hmm. Um, as concise as possible is, is good writing always. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the point is, though, that when you are telling a story, um, you have to make sure that you're not eliminating things that are going to really drive the plot, that are really going to drive the, and compel the prospect in this case. And one of the other things that I think is so great about email marketing is the longevity of the marketing itself. If you see an ad in a social media feed, we all know how hard it can be to get back to that ad. Mm -hmm. Something you saw that caught your eye and accidentally you scrolled past it and it's gone now. You can't find it. You didn't catch the brand's name. You didn't. Mm, so frustrating. You're waiting till you see it again. Um, the same thing can happen uh, in B2B that, that would happen with a consumer interacting with an ad mm -hmm. scrolling is... I don't need this right now, but maybe in the future. And I know that feels like a brush off in most prospecting, but when you have been doing what I've been doing for as long as you have, and, and you do as, as well, John, you know that in pipeline conversion, those deals do come around. Yeah. And, and if you're meticulous about how you stay in touch with those prospects and move their story forward, that they can come around and, uh, and, and, and great storytelling uh, can can keep prospects engaged over a long time and they know to come back and look for it because it's in their email inboxes. They know that it's there. Even if it's been six months, it's a year. They remember that thing that they learned in there because if it was a short and sweet email that was just asking for them for a 15 minute meeting, they're not going to remember anything mm -hmm. about that. They don't care who you were. If you said something interesting and it, and it, leaves a mark in their brain. It might be some time before every prospect comes around. Some will be quicker, some will take longer. But in good sales processes, you don't just look for the short term yeah. ones. You got to get them all. And great storytelling burns that mark into the brain, keeps it there so that when someone comes around, and I've got a great case study to share about this. I don't think I told this story on the last time, but this is a favorite example of how this can happen. And I have other versions of this same sort of thing, but this is mm. the ex most extreme one. I had a client that I was working with in two different periods. We had worked together for, for a period, stopped, and then they came back on. Um, so when I'm working for my clients, they're usually providing me with a company email address that I'm deploying from right. them, or responding for them. And so uh, I had a Zach at company email address that had been set up on the first go around. We did our outreach. We had some great deals close. Um, we, we stopped for a period of time. And then when I came back on, we started going after new targets my email address came back online. While working in that second phase, I got a response to an email from a year before, from the first phase, from when we had been working together. If my email had been turned off, it would have just, they would have received a bounce back. Oh, it's yeah. always forward messages, you never know. Um, the, the person had responded and said, we had somebody who was helping us with this. They're no longer with us. We, I went looking back in my email and I found your message. I'd love to talk. It was a six figure deal. Right. A client of mine, it was a, 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 a hauling service, a junk hauling service. They get hired by construction companies and commercial property to haul off large amounts of furniture and things like that. We had been targeting construction companies. This company told us, they said, we had it every Friday. We want a route that goes around to the residences that we're doing work at and pick up all the debris that's there so that homeowners come around and they want yes. to see the property over the weekend. It's nice and clean. They can see the progress without the debris. Um, and every Friday they had a company that was doing that route for them. Things went sour. They needed someone new. The, the, it was about $8,500 a month 
uh, to have that service running on, on the amount of routes that they need us hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And and what's uh, and what's amazing about that, uh, Zach, is uh, that whole point that you made is if you're just doing short and pithy, right? If I get a short and pithy email, it makes it very easy for me to delete it because I glance at it, not interested, gone. There's nothing compelling. There's nothing that maybe in the second paragraph caught my eye. What's that? What's that white paper you just yeah. shared with me? Or what's that statistic <laughs> from? Hang on a second. Yeah, and and therefore. While you may think you're giving something that's, oh, it's going to be easy and quick for them to read, it's also going to be very easy and quick for them to delete. Quickly discarded. And you know, I, I tell clients with one of the reasons we see such great reply rates uh, is, is because people don't want to discard it because mm -hmm. they can tell that we are thinking about them. They can tell that we're trying to address their needs that we've and it it doesn't come off as like hey i can do this for you book a meeting now yeah exactly who are, who are yeah, you who are <laughs> what i like it, it communicate that you know something about my business communicate that you've worked with businesses like mine communicate that you'd like the chance to talk to me that, that it doesn't take a lot yeah, it it's doesn't. more than what a lot of people are saying and 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 that short that short and sweet approach is dangerous because they they're looking for short-term wins and in business to business sales it's about long term if yeah, you want yeah. if you want to be sustainable a hundred percent well listen thanks again zach all of zach's information it would be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do yeah thanks john um so my company is think alike media so great minds think alike um, what our business does is we bring people together who are thinking about the same problems. Somebody has the problem, they're struggling with it. Somebody's out there trying to solve it. We want them to meet one another. So my clients uh, all have sort of business to business purposes. We're doing cold outreach for them. Um, most of our clients are using it for business to business sales. Some are using it for partnership development, referral development, and then also media outreach. Clients use it for blogs, uh, podcasts, uh, and uh, and and uh, other forms of, of media exposure for their business. We can kind of mix and match all of those things. And so my website's thinkalikemedia.com. Yeah, go check it out. And uh, you, know, you can hear Zach has got a lot of uh, experience here and a great track record of success. So I'd encourage you to go check it out. Thanks again, Zach. Thank you for watching and listening. See you all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks, John. <laughs>